a conversation on judging, then and now. The Historical Society of the District of Columbia Circuit planned to develop this program with video produced by the Federal Judicial Center. Judge Brett M. Kavanaugh of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit welcomes participants and sets the stage for the conversation. Miguel Estrada, a partner at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher in Washington, D.C., serves as the moderator. The panelists are Senior Judge Paul L. Friedman and Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson, who both sit on the U.S. District Court for the D.C. Circuit. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Brett Kavanaugh of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Welcome everyone to the United States Courthouse. This is an event sponsored by the D.C. Circuit Historical Society. The Society, as all of you know, does great work in promoting the history, the rich history, of the federal courts in the District of Columbia, sponsoring panels and events like the one we're about to have today. And over the last year or so, the Historical Society has been working on an initiative a law clerk initiative to bring former law clerks of the federal courts in the District of Columbia back home to the courthouse for events uh, and panels um, and receptions. And we started last fall with a reception with Justice Kagan, who was a former clerk herself on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and that was a smashing success. And we're continuing the law clerk initiative uh, today with another program, a conversation about judging on the federal courts in the District of Columbia. Judge Ellen Huvel deserves great credit for coming up with this idea and with her trademark subtlety and um, uh, pushing it along uh, in a, at a rapid pace and getting it off the ground. And we also thank Linda Farron and Steve Pollack, of course, for their excellent work on this and everything they do for the DC Circuit Historical Society. Today, our panel, uh, our conversation about judging, we have two wonderful judges who are going to talk about uh, their experiences as judges. Uh, judge Paul Friedman, who has been a judge on the Federal District Court here since 1994. Uh, his history with this courthouse goes back before that. He was a law clerk for Judge Aubrey Robinson, for Judge Robb on the D.C. Circuit, an AUSA, an assistant to the Solicitor General, a leading member of the D.C. Bar, has been involved in many capacities uh, in this courthouse over the years, as well as being uh, a superb judge for so many years now. And Judge Friedman uh, and I have become excellent friends through our lunches at the lunch table that we have here in the courthouse, and we talk often about the differences between being a district court judge and a court of appeals judge. And uh, I sit in panels of three, he sits by himself, and he likes to say that, you know, Brett, no job is really less important than being a single federal court of appeals judge. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have with us today Judge Katanji Jackson, who is a wonderful newer member of the federal district court bench uh, here in the District of Columbia, has already made her mark as a superb judge. Uh, someone with a wonderful disposition on the bench who is always well prepared and thorough in her rulings and we're going to hear from her and Judge Friedman as they talk about their experiences. Judge Jackson came uh, with many experiences herself as a federal public defender in private practice as a sentencing commissioner on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. To lead the event, to moderate the event, uh, to grill the judges instead of the other way around, will be Miguel Estrada, one of the very best attorneys in the United States, a great appellate practitioner at Gibson Dunn here in D.C., who has been himself an AUSA and assist assistant to the Solicitor General, and has been a great friend of the Historical Society for many years, um, and for someone I first worked with in 1992, uh, and have been great friends with ever since. So we're so, so happy to have Miguel Estrada here today, to have all of you here today, and to learn from the wisdom of these two excellent judges. Thank you all very much, and I'll turn it over to Miguel Estrada. Thank you. Well, well I should uh, start by thank all of you for coming, and uh, to our judges for being uh, willing to share their insights and wisdom with the rest of us today. We all know they're very busy and that Congress is not giving them any more staff or money. Um, and so it's very good for them to uh, take 
take the time. Now, the title of this panel is Judging Then and Now. Um, for, for those of you who may be a little bit confused, Judge Freeman is the then, uh, and Judge Jackson is the now. Um, and so there may be a lot of questions about how things have changed, how, um, how cases were handled back where you know, dinosaurs you know, trundled through the earth. Um, we can sort of ask those of Judge Friedman. Uh, computer equipment, email, you know, modern technologies, we can talk to uh, Judge Jackson about it. But in any event, um, they got here uh, by dint of their accomplishments uh, and their talent and their intelligence. Um, that, but uh, there is still a process for becoming a federal judge, or so I'm told. Um, and so <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe we should start uh, with a small conversation about the confirmation process um, and uh, how things have changed or haven't changed. Um, how is it that you came to be picked and by whom? How, what would the process was like? We will start with, just, uh, with Judge Friedman. Uh, if you would give us uh, your insights of how things were then and how you think they have or have not changed. And then we will ask similar questions of Judge Jackson. Well, the primary thing that has changed was I was nominated during a lovely two-year stretch when the President and the Senate were controlled by the same party. So what happened in that case was, you know, in the District of Columbia, as, as you know, we don't have any senators. And um, no president had ever given any District of Columbia official um, so-called senatorial courtesy until President Clinton came along. And I guess because uh, Delegate Norton had been uh, very helpful uh, to him during the election, he decided to give her senatorial courtesy and to let her recommend people to the, for the district court uh, to the White House, and apparently committed himself to choose from the people um, she recommended, and also committed himself, apparently, uh, unlike President Obama, to uh, consider just one recommendation, one name from her from each vacancy. So um, life was good. Um, and fortunately for me, uh, and, and just, I don't want to take too long, but but I see Jim Robertson sitting here and I see others sitting here. One of my themes when I was president of the DC Bar years before that was that we didn't have enough uh, minorities and enough women on the bench and I, I pushed that very hard including going up to the hill and testifying at the uh, Senate confirmation hearings of a couple of people who work in this building who should go nameless uh, for the moment. And um, so then here, here I come. and. Um, and Je uh, Delegate Norton had the opportunity to recommend uh, people to a bench that was then uh, made up of primarily white males. The good news for me, at least, was that there were four vacancies at the same time. And so uh, she recommended me along with Judge Kessler and Judge Urbina and Judge Sullivan and about six months later recommended Judge Robertson. Um, so that was the easy part. Getting a hearing was still a difficult thing to do because the Senate, uh, you know, uh, schedules hearings for a variety of reasons on different people and again we don't have any senators so somehow the senators people got hearings before we did but ultimately we got a hearing <coughs> Judge Urbina and I along with a fellow named uh, Bill Downs from from Wyoming um, and Senator Simpson a Republican was on the committee and so he wanted to give Bill a hearing so Judge Urbina and I got hearings as well the same day and it was really sort of a love fest um, and the, the best part was when Senator Simpson, a Republican, said to the five of us sitting there, we are about to con recommend you to be confirmed as federal judges. That was a nice sentence. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I do remember, and then I'll, then I'll stop, Miguel, is he did say something that's, that struck a chord, um, which I've remembered, and that is this. These are lifetime appointments. How do we know? What guarantees can each of the five of you give us? that this is, you're not going to get robitis. You're not going to let your ego uh, make you think you're the, the, the greatest thing that's ever happened. And how do we know that you're going to treat people fairly and decently and civilly? And of course, it's a question that, that can't be answered other than to uh, talk about how you've conducted yourself as a practicing lawyer. But I remember to this day, and I remember the answer I gave to Senator Simpson and the other senators, and remind myself that I made a commitment to them, as I think I did to uh, Delegate Norton and to the President, to 
try not to let my ego get the best of me. Judge Jackson, did you have an easy time? Did people uh, put you in by, by uh, popular demand, like the, the Judge Friedman, or? Well, you know, I think our experiences are somewhat similar. Um, I am impressed that Judge Friedman remembers so many details about his Senate confirmation hearing 20 years ago when mine was less than two years ago and I still, uh, you know, have a hard time remembering because it was such a blur. Um, you know, I, I, the thing I remember most about going through the confirmation process was how much paperwork is involved. There is a lot of forms that you have to fill out, a lot of uh, people you talk to throughout the process, many, many interviews, not only with uh, Congresswoman Norton's commission, but also, uh, you know, people in the White House, people at the ABA, people with, uh, you know, throughout different aspects of uh, the process, and that's even before you get nominated. Uh, and if you're fortunate enough to get nominated, then you um, go before the Senate Judiciary Committee and the lights are, you know, as bright as they are in here in terms of, of the cameras and the attention and um, you do your best not to make a fool of yourself in front of the senators. Um, I think my process was about as good as it could get. Uh, I too was in a situation in which uh, the, the presidency and the Senate were controlled by the same party. Um, which I agree, you know, probably does have an impact on uh, one's progression through the process. Uh, but it's still a lot of stress and a lot of waiting uh, because there is a process at the Senate and it took me um, six months between nomination and confirmation. Um, I, I've heard that then uh, the time frame wasn't quite as extended, uh, but during that period it's pretty stressful because you're trying to do your day job uh, and at any moment you could find out that you um, have been confirmed and, and it affects what you're doing at the, at the time. So, uh, but it all worked out in the end. Did you each have what one might think of as people who were dedicated to helping you through this process at the White House or at the Justice Department? Um, how is it that you were able to go through all of these obstacles and figure out how to get all the forms and fill them out and find, you know, your fifth, you know, your fifth grade essay on, you know, whatever the controversial topic might be. Um, who helped you? Well, there was a person within the uh, Justice Department who's sort of assigned to be your shepherd um, and they send you the forms and you fill them out and then they tell you you've done it wrong and you have to redo it um, and you go back and forth uh, a lot. But I think the Justice Department is usually the main kind of guide through the, the confirmation process. Yeah, I, I had the same experience. There was a person at Justice um, <clears throat> who was a very good guy and, and was very helpful and did the same sort of thing. And we had um, uh, at least one meeting or two meetings over there, and they gave us transcripts of prior, um, of prior confirmation hearings. And, and so you'd sort of get a little idea of how, um, how it might go and the kinds of questions you And of course, might. this is technology. They say, go to the website and watch the right. videos of the prior technology. We, we had hard copies. Exactly. <laughs> and then they told us not to, not to Was talk to paper much. or stone? <laughs> Not to talk too much, just answer the question and don't, uh, don't volunteer anything. Same thing you tell people when you prepare witnesses for trial. That's right. But tell the truth. But tell but the truth. Tell the truth. Yes. Absolutely. Um, is it your impression that the process functions generally for most nominees as it did for you? Uh, do you think it has changed over the years? I mean, I'm talking about you know, the generality of what happens, not outliers on either end. You know, I have the sense, and, and maybe I'm wrong, that uh, for district court nominees, um, it's not all that uh, difficult, no matter who's in the White House and who's uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, because nobody views us as making the law. Uh, nobody views us as the final decision maker, whereas they do view the courts of appeals as the final decision makers in, what, 90% of the cases, 93% of the cases that go through the federal courts. And, uh, you know, once you get through the White House and the Justice Department and the FBI background check and the ABA, they know that you're probably haven't stolen money from clients 
and that you're not a total idiot, um, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna confirm you probably. Um, that that's my sense. I, I don't know, but I, I think that um, there's much more scrutiny of the Court of Appeals nominees. You have traction? I, I really don't have a perspective on that um, because uh, you know I haven't seen the confirmation process for more than about 36 months uh, at this time. So once you get through the Senate and the president signs your commission, which is an important detail, you are thereby a U.S. district judge. Um, how quickly did you get into the uh, job of judging? Well, I, I was confirmed on June 15th, and I was sworn in on August uh, 1st. And um, I left the law firm and took a month and did something fun and relaxed, which I was advised to do by the chief judge of this court, then Judge uh, John Garrett Penn. And on August 1st, and I hired law clerks, and on August 1st, um, my uh, secretary from White and Case, who'd been with me for 10 years then, 30 years now, and my two new law clerks and my wife and I went to Judge Penn's chambers uh, with Judge Aubrey Robinson, for whom I had clerked, and I was sworn in on August 1st. Judge Jackson? I would say my transition uh, was about three and a half weeks. I was not in a firm, so I didn't have to do the wind down mm -hmm. um, that so many people do when they uh, come into this position. And um, the clerk's office here is very, very efficient in uh, transferring cases. So as soon as they know that, <laughs> that a judge is confirmed, um, they start, you know, putting a case, cases in the queue for you. And so I had a very um, I don't know if it was unfortunate uh, circumstance because I was away at the time of my confirmation. It was over spring break and I was in Florida and I came back and, you know, obviously very excited. I said to uh, the chief judge, not this chief judge, but the former one, um, I want to come in and just, you know, sort of talk to you and uh, see what's happening. And when I got to the court, I ran into one of the clerks who said, oh, you must be the new judge. Do you know that there are 150 cases already lined up for you? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and so I ended up actually coming on quicker than I had anticipated because I was worried that things were happening in my cases that were not being attended. So to. tell me uh, <laughs> this. When I was a prosecutor in a different district, the lore was that whenever there was a new judge, they acquired a very lengthy docket, most of which was of canine provenance, and that every other judge <laughs> um, sort of found a case that they had longed <laughs> to see go, um, and that case somehow made its way to the new federal judge. Is that the practice in this district? No, and it, it was. Or and you wish. Our good friends, <laughs> no, our good friends Tom Hogan and Royce Lambert when the four of us came on and, and, and Jim Robertson came on, decided they weren't going to do to us what had been done to them. And so they adopted a new policy, which I think is still a policy, which no judge can transfer a case that is more than two years old. Mm -hmm. And that eliminates a lot of the dogs. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a great, great uh, innovation. Uh, and I am grateful to them to this day. As am I. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of your 150 cases are all new puppies? Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> so so y you become a judge, and that is in part because you're learned in the law. But you know the Federal Judicial Center may think that you are not sufficiently learned in the law, and they send you to something called judge's school. Did that happen to each of you? It's actually called baby judge's school. <laughs> a conversation on judging, then and now. The Historical Society of the District of Columbia Circuit planned to develop this program with video produced by the Federal Judicial Center. Judge Brett M. Kavanaugh of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit welcomes participants and sets the stage for the conversation. Miguel Estrada, a partner at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher in Washington, D.C., serves as the moderator. The panelists are Senior Judge Paul L. Friedman and Judge Katanji Brown-Jackson, who both sit on the U.S. District Court for the D.C. Circuit. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Brett Kavanaugh of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Welcome everyone to the United States Courthouse. 
This is an event sponsored by the D.C. Circuit Historical Society. The Society, as all of you know, does great work in promoting the history, the rich history, of the federal courts in the District of Columbia, sponsoring panels and events like the one we're about to have today. And over the last year or so, the Historical Society has been working on an initiative, a law clerk initiative, to bring former law clerks of the federal courts in the District of Columbia back home to the courthouse for events uh, and panels um, and receptions. And we started last fall with a reception with Justice Kagan, who was a former clerk herself on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, and that was a smashing success. And we're continuing the Law Clerk Initiative uh, today with another program, a conversation about judging on the federal courts in the District of Columbia. Judge Ellen Huvel deserves great credit for coming up with this idea and with her trademark subtlety and um, uh, pushing it along uh, at, a, at a rapid pace and getting it off the ground. And we also thank Linda Farron and Steve Pollack, of course, for their excellent work on this and everything they do for the D.C. Circuit Historical Society. Today, our panel, uh, our conversation about judging, we have two wonderful judges who are going to talk about uh, their experiences as judges. Uh, judge Paul Friedman, who has been a judge on the Federal District Court here since 1994. Uh, his history with this courthouse goes back before that. He was a law clerk for Judge Aubrey Robinson, for Judge Robb on the D.C. Circuit, an AUSA, an assistant to the Solicitor General, a leading member of the D.C. Bar, has been involved in many capacities uh, in this courthouse over the years, as well as being uh, a superb judge for so many years now. And Judge Friedman uh, and I have become excellent friends through our lunches at the lunch table that we have here in the courthouse and we talk often about the differences between being a district court judge and a court of appeals judge and uh, I sit in panels of three, he sits by himself and he likes to say that you know Brett no job is really less important than being a single federal court of appeals judge. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have with us today Judge Katanji Jackson who is a wonderful newer member of the Federal District Court bench uh, here in the District of Columbia, has already made her mark as a superb judge, uh, someone with a wonderful disposition on the bench who is always well prepared and thorough in her rulings, and we're going to hear from her and Judge Friedman as they talk about their experiences. Judge Jackson came uh, with many experiences herself as a federal public defender in private practice as a sentencing commissioner on the U.S. Sentencing Commission. To lead the event, to moderate the event, uh, to grill the judges instead of the other way around will be Miguel Estrada, one of the very best attorneys in the United States, a great appellate practitioner at Gibson Dunn here in D.C., who has been himself an AUSA and assist assistant to the Solicitor General, and has been a great friend of the Historical Society for many years, um, and for someone I first worked with in 1992. Uh, and have been great friends with ever since. So we're so, so happy to have Miguel Estrada here today, to have all of you here today, and to learn from the wisdom of these two excellent judges. Thank you all very much, and I'll turn it over to Miguel Estrada. Thank you. Well, well I should uh, start by thank all of you for coming, and uh, to our judges for being uh, willing to share their insights and wisdom with the rest of us today. We all know they're very busy and that Congress is not giving them any more staff or money. Um, and so it's very good for them to uh, take, take the time. Now, the, the title of this panel is Judging Then and Now. Um, for, for those of you who may be a little bit confused, Judge Freeman is the then, uh, and Judge Jackson is the now. Um, and so there may be a lot of questions about how things have changed, how, um, how cases were handled back where you know, dinosaurs you know, trundled through the earth. Um, we can sort of ask those of Judge Friedman. Uh, computer equipment, email, you know, modern technologies, we can talk to uh, Judge Jackson about. It. But in any event, um, they got here uh, by dint of their accomplishments uh, and their talent and their intelligence. Um, that, but uh, there is still a process for becoming a federal judge, or so I'm told. Um, and so maybe, uh, 
maybe we should start uh, with a small conversation about the confirmation process um, and uh, how things have changed or haven't changed. Um, how is it that you came to be picked and by whom? How, what would the process was like? We will start with, just, uh, with Judge Friedman. Uh, if you would give us uh, your insights of how things were then and how you think they have or have not changed. And then we will ask similar questions of Judge Jackson. Well, the primary thing that has changed was I was nominated during a lovely two-year stretch when the President and the Senate were controlled by the same party. So what happened in that case was, you know, in the District of Columbia, as, as you know, we don't have any senators. And um, no president had ever given any District of Columbia official um, so-called senatorial courtesy until President Clinton came along. And I guess because uh, Delegate Norton had been uh, very helpful uh, to him during the election, he decided to give her senatorial courtesy and to let her recommend people to the, for the district court uh, to the White House. And apparently committed himself to choose from the people um, she recommended and also committed himself, apparently, uh, unlike President Obama, to uh, consider just one recommendation, one name from her from each vacancy. So um, life was good. Um, and f fortunately for me, uh, and, and just I don't want to take too long, but, but I see Jim Robertson sitting here and I see others sitting here. One of my themes when I was president of the DC Bar years before that was that we didn't have enough uh, minorities and enough women on the bench, and I, I pushed that very hard, including going up to the Hill and testifying at the uh, Senate confirmation hearings of a couple of people who work in this building who should go nameless uh, for the moment. And um, so then here, here I come, and, um, and Je uh, Delegate Norton had the opportunity to recommend uh, people to a bench that was then uh, made up of primarily white males. The good news for me, at least, was that there were four vacancies at the same time. And so uh, she recommended me, along with Judge Kessler and Judge Urbina and Judge Sullivan, and about six months later recommended Judge Robertson. Um, so that was the easy part. Getting a hearing was still a difficult thing to do because the Senate, uh, you know, uh, schedules hearings for a variety of reasons on different people and again we don't have any senators so somehow the senators people got hearings before we did but ultimately we got a hearing <coughs> Judge Urbina and I along with a fellow named uh, Bill Downs from from Wyoming um, and Senator Simpson a Republican was on the committee and so he wanted to give Bill a hearing so Judge Urbina and I got hearings as well the same day and it was really sort of a love fest um, and the, the best part was when Senator Simpson, a Republican, said to the five of us sitting there, we are about to con recommend you to be confirmed as federal judges. That was a nice sentence. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I do remember, and then I'll, then I'll stop, Miguel, is he did say something that's, that struck a chord, um, which I've remembered, and that is this. These are lifetime appointments. How do we know? What guarantees can each of the five of you give us? that this is, you're not going to get robitis. You're not going to let your ego uh, make you think you're the, the, the greatest thing that's ever happened. And how do we know that you're going to treat people fairly and decently and civilly? And of course, it's a question that, that can't be answered other than to uh, talk about how you've conducted yourself as a practicing lawyer. But I remember to this day, and I remember the answer I gave to Senator Simpson and the other senators, and remind myself that I made a commitment to them, as I think I did to uh, Delegate Norton and to the President, to try not to let my ego get the best of me. Judge Jackson, did you have an easy time? Did people uh, put you in by, by uh, popular demand, like the, the Judge Friedman, or? Well, you know, I think our experiences are somewhat similar. Um, I am impressed that Judge Friedman remembers so many details about his Senate confirmation hearing 20 years ago, when mine was less than two years ago, and I still, uh, you know, have a hard time remembering because it was such a blur. Um, you know, I, I, the thing I remember most about going through the confirmation process was how much paperwork is involved. There is a lot of 
forms that you have to fill out, a lot of uh, people you talk to throughout the process, many, many interviews, not only with uh, Congresswoman Norton's commission, but also uh, you know, people in the White House, people at the ABA, people with, uh, you know, throughout different aspects of uh, the process, and that's even before you get nominated. Uh, and if you're fortunate enough to get nominated, then you um, go before the Senate Judiciary Committee and the lights are, you know, as bright as they are in here in terms of, of the cameras and the attention and um, you do your best not to make a fool of yourself in front of the senators. Um, I think my process was about as good as it could get. Uh, I too was in a situation in which uh, the, the presidency and the Senate were controlled by the same party. Um, which I agree, you know, probably does have an impact on uh, one's progression through the process. Uh, but it's still a lot of stress and a lot of waiting uh, because there is a process at the Senate and it took me um, six months between nomination and confirmation. Um, I, I've heard that then uh, the time frame wasn't quite as extended, uh, but during that period it's pretty stressful because you're trying to do your day job uh, and at any moment you could find out that you um, have been confirmed and, and it affects what you're doing at the, at the time. So, uh, but it all worked out in the end. Did you each have what one might think of as people who were dedicated to helping you through this process at the White House or at the Justice Department? Um, how is it that you were able to go through all of these obstacles and figure out how to get all the forms and fill them out and find you know your fifth you know your fifth grade essay on you know whatever the controversial topic might be. Um, who helped you? Well, there was a person within the uh, Justice Department who sort of assigned to be your shepherd, um, and they send you the forms, and you fill them out, and then they tell you you've done it wrong, and you have to redo it, um, and you go back and forth uh, a lot. But I think the Justice Department is usually the main kind of guide through the, the confirmation process. Yeah, I, I had the same experience. There was a person at Justice um, <clears throat> who was a very good guy and, and was very helpful, and did the same sort of thing. And we had um, uh, at least one meeting or two meetings over there, and they gave us transcripts of prior, um, of prior confirmation hearings. And, and so you'd sort of get a little idea of how, um, how it might go and the kinds of questions you And of course, might. this is technology. They say, go to the website and watch the videos of the prior tech. We, we had hard copies. Exactly. <laughs> and then they told us not to, not to talk too much. Was it paper or stone? <laughs> Not to talk too much, just answer the question and don't, uh, don't volunteer anything. Same thing you tell people when you prepare witnesses for trial. Right. But tell the truth. But tell the but truth. But tell the truth. Yes. Absolutely. Um, is it your impression that the process functions generally for most nominees as it did for you? Uh, do you think it has changed over the years? I mean, I'm talking about you know, the generality of what happens, not outliers on either end. You know, I, I have the sense, and, and maybe I'm wrong, that uh, for district court nominees, um, it's not all that uh, difficult, no matter who's in the White House and who's uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, because nobody views us as making the law. Uh, nobody views us as the final decision maker, whereas they do view the courts of appeals as the final decision makers in, what, 90% of the cases, 93% of the cases that go through the federal courts. And, uh, you know, once you get through the White House and the Justice Department and the FBI background check and the ABA, they know that you probably haven't stolen money from clients and that you're not a total idiot, um, and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna confirm you probably. Um, that, that's my sense. I, I don't know, but I, I think that um, there's much more scrutiny of the Court of Appeals nominees. Judge Jackson? I, I really don't have a perspective on that um, because, um, you know, I haven't seen the confirmation process for more than about 36 months uh, at this time. So once you get through the Senate and the President signs your commission, which is an important detail, you are thereby a U.S. district judge. Um, how quickly did you get into the uh, job of judging? 
Well, I, I was confirmed on June 15th, and I was sworn in on August uh, 1st. And um, I left the law firm and took a month and did something fun and relaxed, which I was advised to do by the chief judge of this court, then Judge uh, John Garrett Penn. And on August 1st, and I hired law clerks. And on August 1st, um, my uh, secretary from White and Case, who'd been with me for 10 years then, 30 years now, and my two new law clerks and my wife and I went to Judge Penn's chambers uh, with Judge Aubrey Robinson, for whom I had clerked, and I was sworn in on August 1st. Judge Jackson? I would say my transition uh, was about three and a half weeks. I was not in a firm, so I didn't have to do the wind down mm -hmm. um, that so many people do when they uh, come into this position. And um, the clerk's office here is very, very efficient in uh, transferring cases. So as soon as they know that, <laughs> that a judge is confirmed, um, they start, you know, putting a case, cases in the queue for you. And so I had a very, um, I don't know if it was unfortunate uh, circumstance because I was away at the time of my confirmation. It was over spring break. And I was in Florida and I came back and, you know, obviously very excited. I said to uh, the chief judge, not this chief judge, but the former one, um, I want to come in and just, you know, sort of talk to you and uh, see what's happening. And when I got to the court, I ran into one of the clerks who said, oh, you must be the new judge. Do you know that there are 150 cases already lined up for you? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and so I ended up actually coming on quicker than I had anticipated because I was worried that things were happening in my cases that were not being attended So to. tell me uh, this. When I was a prosecutor in a different district, the lore was that whenever there was a new judge, they acquired a very lengthy docket, most of which was of canine provenance, and that every other <laughs> judge um, sort of found a case that they had longed <laughs> to see go, um, and that case somehow made its way to the new federal judge. Is that the practice in this district? No, and it, it was. Or and you wish. Our good friends, <laughs> no, our good friends Tom Hogan and Royce Lamberth, when the four of us came on and, and, and Jim Robertson came on, decided they weren't going to do to us what had been done to them. And so they adopted a new policy, which I think is still a policy, which no judge can transfer a case that is more than two years old. Mm -hmm. And that eliminates a lot of the dogs. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a great, great uh, innovation. Uh, and I am grateful to them to this day. As am I. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of your 150 cases are all new puppies? Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> so, so y you become a judge, and that is in part because you're learned in the law, but you know, the Federal Judicial Center may think that you are not sufficiently learned in the law, and they send you to something called judges' school. Did that happen to each of you? It's actually called baby judges' school, <laughs> common parlance. <laughs> and yes, um, I went out to baby judges' school, and uh, among the people in my class were Sonia Sotomayor, Danny Chin, and uh, David Hamilton. They all got to be appellate judges, um, which is fine. And, uh, <laughs> and um, well, you're not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, um, it was real, and, and I've subsequently taught it at Baby Judges School. It is a really a great thing because um, you're sitting there with 15, 18 other people, all of whom are new judges, who come from very different backgrounds. Yeah, there are a lot of former prosecutors, there are a lot of former defense attorneys, there are people from uh, civil practice, people from you know, different ages and certainly different uh, parts of the country. And um, we all have lots of questions. And there are judges out there who can help us, as experienced judges, who can help answer those questions or direct us to where to look for the answers. And uh, in addition, there are some people that have been magistrate judges or state court judges. So the conversations really give you a, a level of confidence. And I'm uh, thinking about one of the sessions I taught rather than the one that I uh, attended where there was one uh, lawyer who had just become a judge who had never touched a criminal case in her life. And I think I had that judge. Hmm? <laughs> no. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a lawyer or as a judge. Yes. And after a week of interacting with all these other people, she, she had a level of confidence to go back and feel like she 
could actually get started. Yes, the Federal Judicial Center, I think, does an excellent job. Um, I, too, went to baby judges school. Um, one of the things that was particularly helpful to me was uh, a friend of mine who had been uh, confirmed to the SDNY maybe the year before I did said, you might have an opportunity to go to baby judges school at different points early in your career. You should wait, she said, and go after you've been on the bench for a couple of months, um, which was the opposite of her experience. She had gone within a week or so of becoming a judge, and she said she was so new that she didn't even know what, the, what questions to ask um, at that point. And so I waited. Um, I think I went maybe, yeah, I was confirmed in March. I went in late June, um, and it was wonderful. Uh, it, it just it's very similar to what um, Judge Friedman has said. I don't know that they've, they've changed much because it works. So well, it's a little better now because in teaching sentencing, instead of just giving you the book, they have these wonderful vignettes and, and videos so you actually see what sentencing is like. And we're the stars of two of those. Exactly. Think, so. So. <laughs> They're much better. So once you go to BB Judges School, uh, the FJC lets you be, or are there any more programs of instruction? Um, that they try to get you back in? And if so, how does one get into that and how do they choose what is it that they think you need instruction on? Well, I, they, there are sort of continuing legal education programs for judges that the FJC puts on periodically. Um, my understanding is that they send out emails uh, to everyone and judges uh, decide based on their schedule and location of the program whether or not they're interested in attending. And then I don't know how they make the decision, but they you know, make some sort of a cut as to who gets to go. But these programs are repeating. So if, the, you, if you aren't invited to attend one year, you have the opportunity to do it uh, you know, in another year. So um, I actually went to one in New York on um, employment law, which about a year into my tenure, which was really, really helpful. Judge Freeman, have you been doing that over the, over the years? Yes, and you know, every couple of years I think there, there's a general one in two or three different locations and, and you can go and, and, and learn a lot and be, be updated on what the Supreme Court has decided, on employment law, on Section 1983 cases, on the stuff that are sort of the, the bread and butter of what we do, jurisdiction as well as the specialized program that, that are sort of invitation programs because they're more limited. So I gather from one of your earlier answers that some of the judges themselves do the instruction. Do they get instruction from academics or from other sources? I mean, how is it that one goes about picking who is going to teach the judges on employment law, federal jurisdiction, or what have you? Somebody at the FJC, some people at the FJC do, but I think there are leading people in all of those fields and they, and they invite them. And, you know, and, and Supreme Court practice, for example, when I went, at least, uh, your friend, our friend Erwin Chemerinsky was teaching. And, you know, he can... I think he, I did one of them with him, actually. Yeah, I think you yeah. have. And, but, you know, he can cover a lot of ground in 45 minutes. And, and, and uh, <laughs> a lot of it's very practical, too. Uh, judges who have had uh, mass tort litigation or judges who have had major antitrust uh, cases or big class actions. So you get the academic talking about class actions, but you also get some lawyers and, and judges who've had experience as well. So this is all how you learn from the from your colleagues on an institutional basis. How do you learn from your colleagues on an interpersonal basis? Do you have judges who are mentors to you? Um, do you have people in the courthouse or elsewhere to whom you turn, uh, to whom you can properly turn, obviously, um, to sort of seek out guidance uh, and mentoring as you try to do these very difficult tasks? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is yes, I most, most certainly do. Um, you will not be surprised to know that Judge Friedman is one of my uh, frequent go-to guides uh, when I get difficult cases or issues that I'm not quite sure how to handle. Um, I will call him or go by his chambers, uh, Judge Uvell, um, Judge Howell, um, are all people who really uh, I rely upon a great deal in, in my day-to-day -day activities because there's so much that you have to know and face and handle in this position and so it's really important to make connections with, um, with your colleagues. And of course there's always the judge's lunchroom which really um, 
allows you to talk to, to others and get a, a broader feedback about a, a particular issue. So I take advantage of that as much as I can. Judge Freeman, when you first came out on the court, did you have a judge who was a mentor to you? I, I, I would say three people come to mind. One, because of our long-standing relationship, Aubrey Robinson, who I had clerked for and who had been the chief judge of this court and uh, was a mentor throughout from, from the day I came to Washington until the day he died. And, you know, those of you who know Judge Robinson know, nobody had more common sense and straightforward, called him like he saw them, and always gave good, confidential advice. And then the good news was uh, my chambers were next door to Joyce Hedden's Green and two doors down for, from Bill Bryant. And uh, for those of you who've been around for a while, need I say more? Um, Bryant was one of the wisest, most decent people any of us have ever known, and his judgment about people and about evidence and about trials and uh, mankind was incredible. And Joyce Green was a great judge, just a great judge, and she was right next door. And what I used to do, if I was in the courtroom and something happened and I didn't know what to do, I would say in my most poker face look with my most poker face looked I would say well I think this would be a good time for a break and I'd leave the bench calmly and I'd go running into her chambers <laughs> I wouldn't go to my chambers I would go running into Judge Green's chambers and I'd say to her secretary is she here is she here so I'd go in she'd say, Paul sit down calm down what seems to be the problem and as as lots of good teachers do she would never give me an answer she would ask questions and elicit my thoughts and she said, well, that, that sounds like a good plan. Why don't you go through that? <laughs> and um, I think that what we all learn is some of those experiences don't necessarily teach you specifically how to do it the next time, but give you an increasing level of self-confidence to enable you to trust your own intelligence and your own instincts and your own judgment. And, it's a, and, and just one quick footnote to that. I, I'm not sure every district court has what we have here and it's partly because there's so many of us in one building and in some districts they're spread out in lots of courthouses but there are other reasons too but this is a very collegial courthouse and has been most of the time that I've been here and people are very supportive of each other and willing to reach out and be reached out to and, and help and be helpful and it's it's been one of the great joys of, of being here. So just to ship gears a little bit, um, you become a judge and your life changes. You used to have a full um, uh, social calendar and a social life. You had a lot, you know, either you worked in the government, you were, you were a public defender, you were a mofo or a white and case. Um, and then you take the veil and choose this very isolating life. People finally start laughing at your jokes, but you don't <laughs> see them that often. Um, and so, how do you compensate? How do you compensate with uh, for the monastic quality of the life that you have picked or to which you have been sentenced? Um, and uh, how is it that you transition your social lives from um, your former life to what's appropriate for a judge? There was a speaker. I believe at Baby Judges School, who was a psychologist, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, who said something like, um, get closer to your really close friends and be cautious of those who want to be your new best friend. And that was sort of good advice. And you're right, because you know, and, and I know, and, and Judge Jackson goes, when you're practicing law, you can walk down the hall, you chat with people, you run ideas by them, and you can talk to people hey, about stuff. That's how you stuff. get clients. And you talk, you you're got clients. everybody, right? Right? You got general counsels, you got all sorts of people. And you can't talk to anybody. And I remember the first uh, antitrust opinion, civil antitrust opinion I issued. I thought to myself, oh, there's that guy at White and Case who was such an expert. I wish I could run this final draft by him. Um, and then I thought of my, my friends at certain antitrust law firms, and I thought, they're going to look at this and think, I thought Paul was a smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it is more isolating. You have to be careful at dinner parties or at social events what you talk about and what you say. Um, cases that are before the court obviously are, are off limits. 
um, cases that might come before you? What are your views on pick a topic that, that, that might come before you? And who are you talking to? And you, you just have to be cautious. People, I mean, I've had the John Hinckley case for years now, and people always want to talk to me about John Hinckley. Um, and, you know, I don't, I can't. Um, and I, th I think what you have to try to do is, um, I don't think you have to become a, a monk. Um, I think you can go to parties. I think you can go to your friends' homes for dinner. I think you can socialize. It's nice to have some friends who aren't lawyers and judges, uh, as well as lawyer friends, and have some other interests in life, um, and have a, a, a spouse that prods you to do things that uh, gets you away from it all. Um, but, and I do think we, we have less a monastic life than, than perhaps appellate judges have. We at least do see people, people, people. you know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I remember from, uh, from years ago, uh, Judge Bork, who I worked for in the SG's office, uh, spoke to a bar association uh, dinner and somebody uh, talking about what it was like to be an appellate judge and he said, you know, it's sort of, um, it's sort of like being a, a prisoner at a federal uh, penitentiary. You know, you, you're in your chambers just like they're in their cells and they bring you these briefs and you read these briefs and every couple of weeks they let you out to see real people. Now, they are lawyers to be sure, he said, but still people. Um, <laughs> So we see lawyers more frequently than the appellate judges do. We see jurors, we see witnesses. Um, and defendants. Defendants. And, you know, that gives you a slice of, of real life. Um, and and I, think it's, I think it's helpful. And I also think that the interaction with your law clerks uh, is a really important part of this as well. Jackson, how did you cope with the transition from being a young, all about town, well. fancy lawyer, to <laughs> being in the federal courthouse with four law clerks. Well, I was going to say, you know, I'm not nearly as social as Judge Friedman, so it wasn't that big a transition for me, quite frankly. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think everything Judge Friedman said is correct. I also think that it's probably a little bit easier in this town um, where there are so many lawyers and people are uh, mindful of the fact that they can't, they shouldn't approach you and shouldn't talk to you about cases that are pending before you. You know, I think it might be harder in another place where people might be aware that you have a certain case, but they're not um, necessarily, you know, um, mindful because they're not lawyers and they might want to get information from you or talk about the case. So I think here is actually okay because your lawyer friends are not going to talk to you about anything that's before you that would create a problem. Um, and I, I think this point about law clerks are really good. My law clerks and I try to have fun um, as part of, of the whole process, which I think is important. Um, but other than that, I'm okay with uh, being cloistered in my chambers. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about your law clerks then. Um, you, uh, Judge Friedman, um, have a, just a few decades of picking law clerks. Uh, and you started for the last couple of years. Um, could you give us your take on what is it that each of you looks for um, and, uh, you know, the extent to which you weigh, you know, the personality traits against, you know, the quality factors, matters like diversity and the like. How do you go about picking these people that are going to be your own private law firm for a year? Judge Jackson, let's start with yeah, you. Yeah, it's very hard, I have to say. Um, I had not really been in a position prior to this in which I had to make these kinds of hiring decisions, and I think it's not easy um, because you do have to weigh a lot of different criteria. Um, you know, there are things that are really important to me, things like uh, writing ability and writing experience because that's something that, you know, I value highly in my particular little law firm. Um, and so I look for experiences in um, applicants' backgrounds that indicate that they have the ability to produce the kind of written work product um, that, that I expect. Uh, and then you bring them in and you want to really uh, you want to have people who you're going to enjoy 
coming to work and seeing because as Judge because Friedman, a federal prison, I heard. Exactly, as Judge Friedman pointed out, these might be the only people you get to really see or talk to for the whole day, so you want to enjoy them. Um, I always have my current law clerks speak to uh, the applicants who come in, which I think are, is very important because um, you know, I obviously interview them, but I want my law clerks to as well because they sometimes give me insights uh, into the applications that, you know, that I didn't pick up uh, in my conversations. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's tough, but um, very, very important. To, to get it right, because you have such a small group of people working together um, that you really want it to, to gel. I want to ask you this question because you have too few law clerks, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will ask this question of Judge Friedman. Have you been disappointed over the years by having picked somebody that just did not work out? <laughs> <laughs> and is he in the audience? <laughs> Neither he nor she is in the audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've never fired a law clerk. There are some judges on this court who have fired law clerks. Um, you know, some, people, some are better than others. And it, 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 it's, um, it's interesting because um, I remember complaining to uh, a judge on the Court of Appeals one time about somebody who you know, is working really hard and doing the best that he or she could and just wasn't that good a writer but is working day and night to try to get it right. And that judge, again I won't name names, but he isn't necessarily the one that you would have thought would have said this, said, well what more can you ask? Uh, working hard, hard, good work ethic, and trying to, trying to do for you the best that he or she can. But you know, um, some people start as great writers, and um, which is one of the things I look for as well. Uh, because in this court, we, we do a lot of summary judgment opinions and motions to dismiss, and you know, not everything go, not everything, about 97% of things don't go to trial. Um, so writing is, is, is hugely important, but I take some pride in the fact that I think almost everyone has left a better writer than when she or he came. And that's a good thing. Before I had gotten an Oscar account, I was getting applications, you know, in the mail, and we didn't know where to put them, and you couldn't ever find them and when you were looking to call that person. So Oscar is a lot more uh, efficient in terms of that process. Um, you know, I, uh, my law clerks, you know, are, use the computer pretty much exclusively. Uh, although there is one thing that I insist that they do, and that is I insist that they do statutory research in the books. Um, because I really do feel as though it is very hard uh, to do the kinds of statutory research that I am interested in having them do on the computer. It's too easy to miss things. It's not easy to see the entire context of the statute when you're looking at it in the computer. So, Do you have the same view of case books? Because I'm, I'm very old. It would never occur to me to be working on a brief yeah. without actually having the book. Um, but I find that a lot of our young lawyers will only read cases on the computer screen. Do you have the same view? I don't have the same view of the case books. I do have the case books, some of them in my office, and I f find it quicker to, do, to pull them um, if I'm just looking up a quick site. But I think case research, I think, can be done pretty effectively uh, online, although I print out the cases and I still highlight. And I encourage my, my clerks to do that. And if I say, you know, I ask them, please bring me a case, they'll bring it to me in paper. They won't send me an email with an attachment. Um, but statutes, I kind of don't even want them to begin on the computer. I want them to pull the statute book uh, because I think it's important. Judge Freeman, what has been the evolution for you? You started uh, presumably, like I did, uh, did when I was in law school, you know, they, they taught you digest. You had to go pull the books in and find the keyword, um, which I'm not even sure half of the audience would understand what that is anymore. Um, how do you feel that this has changed both the practice of law um, and how you work as a judge, you know, the impact of technology? It hasn't changed the way I work as a judge very much at all, as my law clerks can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Because you don't do it. Because I don't do it. But I mean, they, 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 they uh, do drafts, and I review the drafts in hard copy. Um, they print out 
the key cases for me, and I read them in hard copy. Um, I have to have the U.S. reports in my chambers so I can pull them off the shelf and look at those in, in the books. Uh, we don't have a budget anymore to have Fed Sup and Fed Second or Third, or I guess we're Fed Third now. Um, so they do all the research online, but they print out the key cases for me in, in hard copy and the opinions in hard copy. Um, where it does make a difference to me personally is emails, um, which, you know, we communicate a lot, my clerks and I, by emails. Other judges communicate a lot by emails. Um, you know, if there's an issue that you face as a judge and you would like to have the views of your colleagues, now what typically happens is there will be an email addressed to all of the judges saying, I've got this problem. Have any of you ever confronted this problem before? Do you know of any cases or how have you dealt with this or whatever? And it sometimes engenders a conversation among many, many judges or it sometimes is just one or two who says, absolutely, take a look at this, or here's what I did. And that's very helpful. And the other thing that is helpful to me um, is occasionally, particularly now that I'm a senior judge, I, I do work at home sometimes. And so in that regard, if I'm working at home, my clerks can email me stuff, whether it's briefs or parts of briefs or case law. Um, uh, that's that's uh, very helpful to me. I am never going to be... Um, a technology person. Um, it's too late to teach me uh, certain things, but I do think it's, you know, it's, it's made a huge difference. On the other hand, you know, there was an article in the paper within the last week or so that says that studies have been done that show that you retain more when you read it in hard copy than when you read it on the computer. You're less distracted. You're not going to go check your emails in the middle of reading a, a, a court of appeals opinion. Um, and you tend to remember things sometimes, and maybe that's why you still like going to the books, and I still like going to the books. Oh, I remember it was on the top paragraph of a page. I can visualize where Justice so-and-so was discussing that point, and somehow it's more imprinted on your brain, and maybe uh, the theory goes on your thought process and how you use what you've learned. I personally think that's right, but I'm close to your age. Um, you're not close to my age. No, I think, I think there's something to that, not only the visualization, but um, I wonder, you know, if research could be done or has been done on whether or not opinions have gotten longer, for example, because it's just so easy to type as opposed to the, the you know, process is the way it used to be, writing, handwriting things makes for shorter opinions, makes for um, more streamlined thought. My father is an attorney, and one of the things I always marveled at was the fact that he dictates. Um, he doesn't practice anymore, but the skill of being able to dictate meant that he had to organize his thoughts before he articulated them, and it was something I always wished that I uh, learned, but I didn't, and so now it comes out you know, just <laughs> garbled because you know that you can go back and cut and paste and fix. Whereas, I, I still dictate. Yes, and I dictate it's short opinions. I dictate orders. I dictate letters. And I think that skill is amazing. And I think it is. It, it's a lost art in a sense because now when you type, you can just type so much, and it can be totally disorganized, and then you fix it. Whereas you and know. The other thing is, I mean, some things you want to be conversational, but even things you don't want to be conversational, you want to flow. And I had a law clerk who, before he gave me the final draft of an opinion would um, close his door and read it aloud mm -hmm. to see how it flowed as he heard the words come out of his mouth rather than just saw them on a Did paper. Did you keep him for an extra year? <laughs> Pardon me? Did you keep that law clerk for an extra year? <laughs> uh, I kept him for two years, and he still does the same thing, and he's doing a lot of appellate briefs right now in Supreme Court litigation. Have you found from your law clerks or otherwise a technology gizmo that you think increases you know, the efficiency of your work um, that you had not had before? Just to give you an example, some, some young lawyer in my firm gave me some app that uses your iPhone to turn something into a PDF. And so you can be on a trip and you're marking up something by hand like I do, and you use your iPhone and off it goes an email as a PDF. Do you have anything like that that your locker gave you that you want to share? Oh, geez. Um, 
Well, I do use an iPad when I travel, and I ask my law clerks to send me drafts in PDF form because I use, I guess it's, maybe it's called PDF, PDF Expert or something, an app that allows you to edit, uh, that you can, you can actually edit this you know, document, and I found that to be very useful in terms of the communication back and forth on editing a draft. Judge Freeman, I'm guessing your answer is going to be a yellow pad. I think I'll pass on this round. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're making good progress. I, I am very curious to ask you about your impressions of the bar, uh, the practices in front of you. Um, it's a very sophisticated legal market. I would expect um, that the quality of the practice is good, but maybe I am wrong. You tell me, each of you, please. Oh, I think that I think the quality of the practice is excellent, and I, and I don't know whether or not it's because we are in D.C. and we we um, attract so many lawyers. But in general, I, I think you know the private bar, the um, government lawyers. I think everyone is that I have seen uh, has been really really good. Yeah. I, I agree with that. We've been uh, very lucky here. Let's start with the criminal side of things. I mean, the United States Attorney's Office has for decades and decades being just a first-rate operation that hires terrific people. And uh, they do an excellent job. Uh, I think there's, uh, there, is, there is this little problem, which is when some of us, uh, Judge Walton and I, were growing up in the U.S. Attorney's Office, we got lots of trials when we were young, um, because in those days, uh, misdemeanors were also jury trials. Uh, not petty offenses, but misdemeanors were jury trials, and now they're, they're not. So we get a lot of prosecutors trying cases here in federal court who've had trials, but they haven't had many jury trials. That's my one caveat, but they're very good. The Federal Public Defender Service is terrific, and A.J. Kramer and his people are quite wonderful, every last one of them. And with A.J.'s help and the judges of this court and others, we have selected very, very good people for our Criminal Justice Act panel. And I think, by and large, we get defendants get really good representation, and so does the government in criminal cases. In civil cases, I agree with Judge Jackson, you know, uh, for the most part, this is a great city for lawyers, and we get really good lawyers. Now, not everybody's a really good lawyer, and not every client can afford uh, to hire the very, very best. And so you get some small firms and some sole practitioners who vary in quality, but some of them are terrific, too, and do a really wonderful wonderful job for their clients. So I think, uh, by and large, we have a very good bar that uh, serves the courts quite Dr. well. Dr. Friedman, uh, I have heard many judges complain that the level of civility in the bar has mm -hmm. declined over the years. Um, I don't have any firsthand experience of that, but you do see a lot of judges and possibly some of the squabbles about discovery and what have you that prompt lack of civility experiences. Um, how would you assess you know, the state of the bar? Um, how has it improved or uh, become worse during your years on the bench? Well, I, I, civility has been one of my big things, and I've written about it, and I've spoken about it, and, and uh, you know, the bar adopted these voluntary standards on civility. I, I don't think it's as, as I think there is l less civility in society generally than there used to be. And, uh, and in the halls of Congress and lots of other places, and there's less civility uh, in the bar. And part of it is just the nature of the growth of the bar. Uh, you know, when, when our mentors, uh, Judge Robinson and Judge Rob, uh, my mentors and others, and, and Judge Robertson's mentors, uh, John Pickering and others, Lou Oberdorfer started out, the bar was smaller. Everybody knew each other. You knew that you were gonna see the same lawyer uh, the next week or the next month in court, and you, uh, you better treat each other well. Um, the lawyer who was taking the deposition was more often than not the lawyer who was going to try the case, and so was the lawyer on the other side. Now, particularly in big cases at big firms, the lawyers who are tr doing the deposition have one little tiny piece of it and don't see the big strategy and the big uh, picture, and, and maybe they feel that in order to impress the partner, or impress the client, they've got to be tough and tenacious and difficult, uh, even if it doesn't accomplish very much uh, substantively. And I think what you find is, in some respects, 
more civility in those segments of the bar that are still smaller where everybody knows each other. So in some ways, at least in this court, I don't know if it's true in Superior Court, the civility between the Federal Public Defender and the U.S. Attorney's Office, the relationships are very, very good. They seem to work very well together even though they're on the other side. In the medical malpractice bar, which is the one area we do get diversity cases, those lawyers are seeing the same lawyers all the time. And if they don't treat each other well and accommodate each other, they're in trouble because that expert witness is only available Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. And so you better accommodate the lawyer on the other side or he's not going to accommodate your doctor when it's, when it's your turn. Um, so I am concerned about civility. I'm concerned about lack of punctuality showing up in court. I'm concerned about the casualness with which some lawyers treat uh, court appearances and the dignity of, of the court. Um, but I still think we've got a great bar and, and some wonderful lawyers that are doing great work for their clients and they're serving the courts well. One aspect um, that we haven't covered about, you know, people um, who helped you with this very important work is you have another whole set of judges in the building. Um, obviously, you know, there's, you know, the Court of Appeals and, you know, everybody knows about them. Uh, <laughs> but you also have, you know, the magistrate judges doing a lot of very important work. Um, would you give me your impressions of how is it that they fit in the work that you do in your chambers? How, how do you partner with them to get things done? Um, I assume this has changed for you, Judge Friedman, since you know, the names have changed over the years, um, uh, even, even the role a little bit. Uh, but I would love to have your impressions on how you see the partnership with the magistrate judges in getting cases done. Well, we've been very, very lucky because uh, we've had some, I mean, since I've been here, Judge Robinson and Judge Kay were here before I got here. Judge Facciola came a few years after I got here. He's just retired. So it's been the same uh, cast of characters. We do not use magistrate judges as well or as efficiently as a lot of districts do. And part of it's the, just the history and the tradition of the court. Part of it's the nature and the, and the, and the size of the caseload. There are some districts in this country, Judge Jackson was talking about getting 150 cases when she started. Some of her friends at Baby Judges School and some of the people I've taught at Baby Judges School start with 700 cases. Sure. Um, and there's some districts, which it's just unbelievable. And so half the cases go to magistrate judges. Now they can't try the case without the consent of the parties, but when you come into that courthouse, you're assigned you know, Judge X and Magistrate Judge Y, and half the cases go to the Magistrate Judge automatically for everything up until the moment of trial. Um, we've never had that tradition here. We haven't needed it, we haven't developed it. So what we have, have relied on our Magistrate Judges for is, to a large extent, discovery, um, uh, attorney-client privilege questions, sometimes reviewing documents where they're huge documents cases, uh, with Judge Facciola, who's an expert on e-discovery since electronic discovery has been so important. He's been such a resource. He's a national expert on it. And, um, and certain, uh, certain other things. Different judges uh, rely on them for different uh, kinds of things. And in addition to the wonderful mediation program run by the Circuit Executive's Office, Judge Facciola and Judge Kay have become recognized experts in settlement and mediation and uh, boy they've they've settled a lot of cases a lot of really complicated cases and I think I've used them more for settlement and complicated discovery than anything else other judges use them probably more extensively or ask for their help more extensively yeah. Jackson, have you had opportunity um, much opportunity I have to work? I, I um, too use them for settlement um, I refer certain kinds of cases to them because they have um, experience, more experience and expertise in certain particular areas of the law than I did when I started. So, um, you know, social security cases, IDEA cases, um, and I uh, ask for their help in certain cases in terms of full case management up until the point of trial. But, um, but I think uh, Judge Freeman is right that we have sort of a unique tradition regarding the utilization of mag magistrate judges in this court. All right. I think we're coming close to winding down. We have a few minutes uh, for some questions. I have just two last questions, one for Judge Jackson. Um, what kind of judge would you like to be 
remembered as oh. in 20 years. Wow. That was one that was not on the script. I'm not prepared to answer that. Don't tell people uh, on the script. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. I think that I would like to be remembered as a judge who was both careful and thorough in my opinions. Um, I think, as I said, the writing is very important to me. Um, I feel, especially in the age of Westlaw, where people can get on the computer and pull up your opinions, that they represent me in a way. Um, and so I'm a, you know, a, a person who is sort of very organized and thorough in my thought processes, and so I like for my opinions to reflect that. Um, so I think if I could have a legacy, it would be um, sort of careful and thoughtful and thorough, uh, in my opinions. And Judge Friedman, what did you learn the hard way that you wish somebody had told you? Well, um, other than not to agree to do panels like this. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things come to mind, I guess. One is sort of the relentlessness of the job, that there's always another case waiting to be decided, another motion for summary judgment, another discovery dispute, something else comes in the door. There's always more to do. And so in order to avoid burnout, Judge Bryant, uh, Judge Bryant used to say to me, he said, you know, Paul, um, if, if you burn the candle at, at both ends twice as bright, but it lasts half as long. And um, you can't make everything a priority, and you can't go home at night worrying about everything that you left behind at the office. So you've got to work really hard, try to get it right, decide the case, move on to the next case, uh, pace yourself, um, and, and um, you can't know the file in that case as well as you did when you were in private practice. You have to rely on your law clerks, and you have to rely on the lawyers to present the best arguments and to organize the case. And, and the second thing I, I would say is to remember the effect that your decisions and even your choice of words sometimes has on people. I mean, 50% of the litigants leave the courthouse unhappy. They lose, right? But you'd like them at least to feel that they were treated fairly and they were treated with respect and that their arguments were treated uh, with respect. And um, the power of the words that you, the power of the words you use in the courtroom uh, and in your opinions matters. So I guess those are two things that I learned the hard way, and I could give you examples, but I won't. <laughs> Are there any questions? If not, we can bring the panel to an end. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you to Judges Friedman and Jackson. Thank you.